My name is James Oldham, and uh, this short lecture is on humor in the music of Lawrence Crane. The reason why I think it is an important talking point is that his humor, if present at all, is embedded in the music and never a categorizing factor. That is to say, Lawrence is hardly considered a music comedian, as opposed to perhaps PDQ Bach or even Bill Bailey, um, where comedy is the primary intention. So I've asked myself the following four questions, which will be framing this talk. Number one, is Lawrence Crane even funny? <laughs> Number two, how might we describe such a specific form of humor? And number three, what comic devices are used in Lawrence Crane's work? Four, how might these devices manifest in my own performance? So question one, is Lawrence Crane even funny? Yes. <laughs> yes, he is. He is, he is very funny. Humor is subjective. A consideration is how much knowing Lawrence's sense of humor has an impact on the reception of his work. Am I amused by his music because I know how funny he is in conversation? The subjectivity of humor comes in two forms here. One, whether we find the humor funny or not, the reception, and two, whether we agree on the existence of humor at all, the intention. The latter here may also apply to whether Lawrence has intended the work to be funny or not. In some cases, the music is quite blatantly funny. Can we have example one, please? Throughout this talk, I will be illustrating what I mean by words such as funny, humor, and comedy, and contextualizing my own work within the themes discussed. In Lawrence's work, there is sometimes the use of humor in titles, as has already come up today. For example, Weirdy, which we just heard a clip from, Tour de France Statistics, or Piano Quintet, in fact, Piano Quintet could be considered a particularly comic title, as it may function as a setup of expectation that is ripe for subversion due to its rich historical baggage in the form, as Julian mentioned earlier as well. Um, but I am interested in the performances themselves, looking at the music and, in some cases, visual aspects that make Lawrence's work not only compelling to me, but also funny. So question two, how might we describe such a specific form of humor? I would like to discuss Lawrence's humor in the context of Olav Westphalen's writings on dysfunctional comedy. Westphalen is a visual and performance artist who often works with comedy in his own work. In his 2016 article, Tools for Fools, Westphalen proposes Art that embraces its paradoxical roots doesn't have to come in the form of open jokes or comedy. It can just as well be manifested as deadpan seriousness, tedium, boredom, nerdy narrow-mindedness, in other words, as crypto-comedy. The term crypto-comedy is perhaps a fitting description of Lawrence's humor. This is comedy that lays low, that does not appear unless you are keyed in the comedy of Andy Kaufman is perhaps the best known example I can think of of what Westphalen means by crypto comedy. 
1980, Kaufman went on uh, Letterman, and uh, where celebrities typically go to promote their latest project and give an insight into their glamorous lives. But this format was derailed when a disheveled Kaufman had nothing to promote and even asked the audience not to laugh at him. This combination allowed for comedy to emerge from the confusing and non-comic context he had set up. Most of the laughs came from the keyed-in audience who were looking for laughs in the performance of a known comic. Crypto comedy, as a form of dysfunctional comedy, is a subversion of subversion, where jokes and comic structures are not there. We can think of it as humor without humor. And in Lawrence's case, we can interpret it as functional music without function. Lawrence uses found musical objects such as scales and chords, which are often loaded with their own suggestions of voice leadings and tensions to be released. Lawrence will often take simple fragments which might be layered on top of one another, interrupted with unexpected pauses or repeated an unexpected number of times. These subversions or incongruities are less laugh out loud funny and more a type of absurdity. But this absurdity is a part of Lawrence's signature sound. It's what David Huron describes as weirdness, where the recognizable becomes distinct through the composer's own compositional treatment of the found material. These kinds of weird or absurd subversions can be found in my recent work, Duration, Duration and. Uh, can we have example number two, please? <laughs> Laughter is not a common reception of Lawrence's music, although today we've seen otherwise. And the term irresistibly droll has been aptly applied to his work, suggesting a subtle form of deadpan amusement that keeps us coming back for more. That said, true to the definition of crypto comedy, there are shifts in performance practice in Lawrence's work that explore visceral performative aspects and visual cues, such as in Gliani Prog. Which brings us to question three. What comic devices are used in Lawrence Crane's work? I would now like to identify some of the comic devices in Gliani Prog. A 2014 duet for flute and piano. This work was originally performed by Lawrence Crane and Manuel Zuria and has since been played more recently by other performers. The context of the performance is typically for concert or recital setting. The original performance was approximately 15 minutes long, but more recent performances are 22 minutes or to, to 26 minutes in length. There is a bell on stage from the beginning of the performance which is not used until approximately 12 minutes into the piece. I believe that this bell creates a tension that will not be released until a substantial way in. Gliani Prague has three distinct sections. In the first section, the bass flute plays a simple scalic passage. We have example three. <laughs> Uh, 
and the piano plays slow, tolling chords. These simple phrases are separate from one another in this section, with each player taking it in turns to play their respective material, even with considerable pauses of up to 20 seconds between one another. There is a lot of development within this section, but within very narrow parameters. The establishing of these parameters is important to create contrast or droll subversion between the first and second sections. In the second section, the material changes to a much more driving material in the piano. an idiosyncratic chord marked triumphant in the score and short arpeggiated gestures in the flute, which will return in the final section. The contrast between the first and second sections are then upstaged with a significant gear shift into the third section when the bell rings. And the players, who in this recording are Manuel Zuria and Mark Knoop, speak. Yanni Prog. The Years of Prog. The title of the work and its translation. The musical material for this third section is... <laughs> the musical material for this section is open scored. The players are now playing vamped phrases out of sync with one another. <laughs> out of sync with one another until each other, uh, until they reach the next, <coughs> the next bell. Um, the bell part is also in the score and is, mostly, <coughs> and is mostly played by the pianist, but is also played a few times by the flautist. The bell tends to have, uh, the bell tends to have the effect of switching <coughs> switching the parts around. The piano's line is now being played by the piano's line is now being played by the flute is now being played by the flute and vice versa. The odds are the odds are inevitably stacked against the flautist as inevitably stacked against the flautist as we hear how easily the piano plays both lines and with the addition of speech how easily the pianist can talk and play at the same time, pushing the flute to the limit. Yet another comparison with crypto comedy here, where the emergence of a situation outside the parameters occurs and makes a layered yet non-didactic statement. Because of the vamped material here, the two players are respectively... <laughs> Because of the vamped material here, the two players are respectively unaware that they will be interrupted, despite knowing approximately when. The performer-led performer indeterminacy uh, for this section, unlike the first and second sections, unlike the first and second, unlike the first and second sections, evolves depending on how, like a comedian. The, perform the performers play the room. Depending on how, like a comedian, the performers play the room. 
This third section was also developed in a similar way to how a comedian might develop their act, where Lawrence, having performed in the original performance, kept the indeterminate part. <laughs> kept the Thank you.